Hello everybody, good evening, welcome to the webinar this evening. Uh, my name is Daniel Fleeman and with me tonight is three times national cyclocross champion Ian Fields. Um, this, evening, this evening we're going to talk, um, uh, Ian's going to talk briefly about um, the skills element of cyclocross, uh, equipment choice, uh, tyre pressure, that sort of thing. Then I'm going to do um, a really brief run down on some um, training sessions for cyclocross and then afterwards we're going to do a um, Q&A session. So during the webinar if you um, you should be able to see on your screen where you can send in questions. So if you send, type in the questions um, as we're talking this evening um, we'll do our best to answer as many uh, many of those questions at the end as we, uh, as we have time. We should be online uh, roughly for one hour. So um, I'd just like to introduce Ian, um, and then he'll he'll start talking um, this evening. Hi, um, Ian Field, three times British Cyclocross champion, and uh, just going to go through some of the basics of um, cross. Um, the great thing about cross is that you never stop learning. No matter what level you are, there's always something you can improve on. So we're going to get going and good place to start is with the starts. Um, fundamental thing, there's the, the classic phrase, um, a good start won't win you a race, but a bad start will definitely lose you a race. So it's pretty key, um, no matter where you're gridded, <coughs> the kind of, the same technique is used. Um, on the morning of the race, you need to look at the start line, the start area, kind of the approach to the first corner, and uh, work out your gear selection. Um, the majority of times, it's going to be on a hard-packed, flat surface. So for myself, you're looking at um, kind of big ring second, big ring third. Um, but you obviously need to, need to practice this in your skill sessions during the week and then obviously on the day maybe try a couple of different gears before the actual start of the race so you're totally ready. Um, the next thing with the starts is you need to work out your pedal and crank position best for you. I start with my dominant leg, uh, so my right leg with the cranks at between 2 and 3 o'clock if you're looking at um, a clock face as it were, 2-3 o'clock and talking about the pedal position, we're talking about the pedal that you're not clipped into. Um, the amount of people that come to me and ask about starting and I say, well, what do you normally do? And they say, oh, I don't know. The key thing is having um, kind of a sequence that you go through every race um, that works for you. Uh, personally, I've set the pedal at kind of a 45 degree angle. So when the left foot goes back to meet the pedal, it hits the flat surface. You don't want your pedal kind of at a funny angle, so you're hitting the edge of it, so you're losing your foot before you've even got going. Um, but this is personal preference. A lot of people have their pedal flat and kind of come down from the top with their left foot um, and clip in that way. It's just in practice, find what works for you and do it every time. There's no point... Um, practicing and then forgetting about it on uh, race day. So that's the focus part. Focus on your kind of sequence that you do before the start and hopefully um, it should work out every time. Uh, body position, you need to kind of be in an aggressive stance. It's very tight on the grid of a cross. So you need to be kind of elbows out a little bit, uh, strong position on the bike. I prefer the hoods you can get to the brakes, you can get to the gears, um, it's a strong position to be in on your bike, left forward, ready to go. Um, personal preference when you start on the saddle or off the saddle, uh, personally I start off the saddle, but I know a lot of guys start on the saddle um, and get going just as fast that way. Again, it just um, experiment, see what works for you and just stick with it. So I think that's pretty much starts covered. Okay, dismounting. Um, you have to do this pretty much every cross race, um, depending on 
the conditions and obstacles on the course. It can be once a lap, it can be five, six times a lap. Um, the key to this, like the starts, is finding what works for you and practicing it day in, day out, week after week, building up to the cross season. Um, there are a few more fundamental things that are do's and don'ts. Um, so when you're approaching an obstacle, you really need to have your hands on the hoods where you can get to the brakes, basically. Um, obviously, you need to be able to slow down a lot of the time before the obstacle, before your feet hit the ground. You can't all run at 25k an hour like Usain Bolt. You need to be covering that brake with the left hand. Um, feathering in England, we're feathering the back brake. Um, elsewhere, you'll be feathering the front brake, which um, brings me up to another point which I prefer to have my brakes the English way so I am feathering the back so the back wheel isn't lifting going into an obstacle but that's a whole different argument. Um, before you leave uh, the bike hands should be on the top tube so you're ready to either carry the bike in a kind of suitcase position traditional over the planks or to flick it up onto your shoulder. Um, the next big thing is the step off, step through argument. This is one of the longest, um, longest going arguments in cross. Um, it's being rivaled by discs versus canties at the moment. But personally, I need to look at the top 20 guys um, in the world. They're all stepping off. No one steps through. It kind of complicates things. As you can see in the photo, um, you can have to dismount in any conditions and for me stepping off just is a lot more simple um, it's a lot safer in my opinion um, if you're used to stepping through I'd kind of stick with it but maybe step off give it a go you don't need so much speed being carried when you step off so for me it's kind of all round a little bit better uh, thinking about gear selection when you're dismounting, it's more about when you're remounting. You can't. You need to think ahead of when you're getting back on your bike. You're in the correct gear for then. Um, different obstacles you need to get off for. It's planks, fallen trees, mud, banks, any inclines that you can't ride. Um, whether there's a crash ahead of you, we saw that at Worlds this year. You need to be versatile and be able to dismount in any situation. Really, if someone falls in front of you, you need to be able to get around them. When the speed drops, kind of a lot, you see a lot of people riding along very slow speed in heavy mud. You need to get off. You need to get off, pick your bike up, and run. Fundamentally, you need to dismount the bike when it's faster to do so. So that brings us on to remounting. So hand placement again, this isn't so crucial. Um, tops, hoods, and uh, sometimes even on, you need to get on on the drops. So the hand placement on this slide relates to the fact that you need to be practicing getting on your bike with different hand positions. If you're jumping on just before you're going down a steep, muddy bank, you need to be on the drops covering those brakes. Uh, like we see in this picture, guy in the sand, right on the tops in the sand, so he's jumping on on the tops. It's just you need to be able to be versatile with this remounting. One fluid movement. We uh, don't want the double step um, situation, so it's literally um, very hard to explain over here. But like in the photo, you can see a clear kind of hop straight slide onto the saddle and away you go you clip in as fast as possible hit that right foot if you're uh, right-handed down hard on the pedal to get clipped in and sprint away as fast as possible the final thing about remounting is thinking about where you're actually getting back on the bike if you have to dismount um, just before a corner there's no point remounting and then having to go around the corner and then getting up to speed remain off the bike, run around the corner, get back on. It's the same if you're coming up to a steep bank and you've had to get off. There's no point getting back on your bike to just get back off it again. It's better to remain off the bike, keep your speed, and just think about where you need to remount. Another classic is um, kind of if you're going along a flat piece of uh, track and there's a downhill and you need to remount. Don't remount 
on the flat section and you have to get up to speed before you go down the hill, kind of jump on on the crest of the hill so you're actually carrying speed while you're getting clipped in down the hill as long as it's not too rough and uh, too muddy. So that moves us on. <coughs> when to shoulder the bike. See so many people just dragging their bike through mud and sand and just making life hard for themselves basically. You need to be picking your bike up when there's larger obstacles um, and the ground conditions are super heavy. Like when there's deep mud, like ankle deep mud, you need to be shouldering that bike. Uh, you can see the photo of myself um, at Bradford National Trophy with the classic uh, arm around the front of the bike with the bike securely on the shoulder. That's the main thing. Once the bike's on your shoulder, it needs to be there and secure. Um, if you've got shorter arms underneath the down tube holding onto the drops, fine. Um, but don't really want to see any of the kind of limp, uh, limp wristed right hands kind of just on the stem or just flailing around. And use that left arm if you're right handed to really help with the running um, up banks really get a swing with that arm um, like the sprinters do and uh, that lean forward into the obstacle into the banking so your momentum's going forward. The other good thing about shouldering a bike is if the course is pretty narrow, it actually makes you very wide and uh, ultimately no one can get past you. Um, so it's a great way of also using it as a tactic. Um, shouldering the bike ultimately is faster uh, when the conditions um, are suited. So definitely keep practicing shouldering the bike along with the classic kind of suitcase carryover planks. Brings us on to cornering. Um, one of the best cornering guys in the business on the slide, TJ, Tim Johnson. Um, first and foremost, look where you want to go. As you're entering the corner, look to the apex. Um, nine times out of ten, wherever you're looking, that's where your body will end up. If you're looking at that tree on the exit, you're going to hit it. If you're looking at that route on the approach to the corner, you're going to hit it. So look where you want to to go, look to the apex and then once you've hit your apex off the brakes and you're looking to your exit point, um, you're looking for traction. Um, as the old saying, uh, green is grip, so you're looking for the grass. Um, maybe the fastest line isn't always the racing line in cross. Um, it differs to uh, some kind of disciplines where, where you have to kind of come off the racing line to go fast. Um, a lot of guys who race cross will know what I'm talking about here um, in terms of kind of going deep into a corner or on the grass and cutting back so you can exit on the grass. Um, as the course develops, as the race goes on, I mean, there can be 60 to 100 guys in a race. They're all doing seven to eight laps. That's, you can do the maths. That's a lot of uh, tyre tracks. And as the race goes on, obviously the racing line develops and therefore the fastest line develops. You just need to be versatile with cross and keep looking um, and ready to change lines. Um, don't get stuck um, in a routine of riding the wrong line for the entire race. And don't be afraid to put a foot out. If things are going wrong, get your foot out to stabilize yourself, um, especially on off camber turns. It can be used to really get that weight on the inside of the bike more um, that you wouldn't be able to with the feet clipped in. Um, it's not not kind of a sign of weakness taking your feet out, um, just practice, practice, practice and um, it won't be any slower. Um, keep pedalling. A lot of people kind of cruise into the corner and freewheel around the corners and then obviously get on the pedals to exit. Um, with cross and with every kind of um, discipline, um, if you've got um, power going through the rear wheel it means the bike's a lot more stable and you're going to actually have more traction. Um, so the earlier you can get on the pedals, obviously you have to be wary of clipping your inside pedal as you corner. But the more you can continue pedaling, um, especially on real tight hairpins that they like to put in cross courses, um, braking and pedaling at the same time is is a valid technique so just keep traction going to your rear wheel and it really stabilizes the bike 
and actually helps the bike turn. Uh, you can imagine when you get to the apex of a real tight corner, if you continue pedaling on a left-hander, the inside foot, so your left leg will go drop down as you hit the apex, actually transfers weight to the inside of the bike and actually helps the bike turn. So practice this um, in your cross sessions, pedaling through the corners, and uh, hopefully you'll see the improvements. The final thing, if you're running tubulars, it actually stops the tubular rolling so much in the corners. If you've got power going through the tub, it won't actually fold as much, um, which is always a bonus. And fundamentally, it's all about exit speed. You can go in as fast as you like to a corner, but if you have to scrub everything off at the apex and you leave the corner with no speed, you've got to get that bike up to speed. That's more energy over an hour. If you do that in every corner, it adds up. So maybe sometimes sacrifice a bit of uh, entry and apex speed to actually get that exit speed. Um, the less energy you have to use to get the bike up to speed, the better really over the course of an hour. Tire pressures. Um, if I had a fiver every time I got asked about tire pressures, I'd be a lot richer. Um, fundamentally, it comes down to rider weight. I mean, I could tell you the pressures I run, but if you weigh 10, 15 kilos more than me, it's not going to work for you. And also, it depends if you're running tubulars or tires. Obviously, with the tubulars, you can run much lower pressures. Um, according to the conditions, you need to change your tire pressures. Um, obviously, um, course obstacles matter as well. If there's a lot of curbs or road sections, you need to be running them a li little harder to uh, minimize the kind of pinch flats and the rolling in corners. But I'd have said nine times out of ten, people run their tubs and tires too hard. Um, you need to be feeling them squirm a little bit in the corners. You need to be feeling them kind of looking for traction. Um, if they're not kind of squirming, they're not low enough. Um, you kind of probably need to be hitting the rim probably once a lap. Um, if they're not that low, then they're probably a bit hard. Um, finally, the level of experience you're at. I mean, I've been racing cross for uh, 14 years now, so... I've kind of got used to riding on tubulars at low pressures and you begin to know what's right and when you've gone too soft. Um, that kind of folding in the corner, that's that's not really what you want um, because then it goes from a lot of traction um, to actually losing traction because the casing's folding. So it's just trial and error and you'll know what I mean when you actually feel the tub squirming underneath you in a corner but not folding. So just go out there and practice with different pressures. Take your pump with you to your local training ground and just do different kind of corners, uh, fast corners. And remember on race day, um, in warm-up, the pressures might be fine, but you add five, six kilometers an hour in the corner in the race, and it's a whole different ball game. So make sure you've done a few of the corners on the pressures you're going to run at race speed. So hopefully that's most things covered with tire pressures. The tire choice fundamentally comes down to course conditions, actually what you've got in your locker. Um, I'm obviously sponsored by Challenge from the photo, but um, in terms of different treads, uh, we've got fundamentally the file tread, the chicane, which is kind of file tread middle, and then the uh, aggressive side knobs, the fango, which is a bit of an all-rounder, the griffo, which is kind of a fast all-rounder, and the limus, um, which is for heavy mud. And um, because you've been good enough to log into this webinar, I'll let you into a little secret that Challenge are going to be bringing out a baby limus at some point. So this is basically a limus with a lot shallower um, tread pattern, so it's going to be a lot faster um, than the limus. Um, and it should really be good for a lot more conditions than uh, what the limus is at the minute. Um, so depending on your skill level, depends how much grip you actually need. Um, obviously, the faster the tread, uh, the better. So the longer you can run the faster treads, I would. 
Um, fundamentally, the file tread is for sand. Um, even when it's dry and dusty, I'd still run the Griffo. Uh, it just has that extra bit of uh, cornering safety in the corners and uh, allows you to go a bit faster fundamentally throughout the whole course. And finally, don't forget it's a cross race and you're allowed to change equipment during the race. If conditions are changing, then change your tyre choice. Um, change bikes, change, get your pit crew to change wheels and uh, take it from there. Brakes. This is the latest, biggest argument in cross and uh, for me there's still pros and cons for both at the minute. Um, I mean discs obviously every time you hit the brakes the braking is going to be the same, it's powerful and no matter what the conditions, if you've been through mud, sand, when you get to that next corner the brakes are going to be there. Unlike the canties which obviously depends what's on the rim when you hit the brakes, obviously we've all had that feeling of going into a corner of hitting your canty brakes and there's nothing there for the first few meters. So it actually leads you to braking earlier um, in those sorts of conditions. However, the disc brakes are heavier and um, there's still kind of slight problems um, being ironed out with the pads and um, the wheels, um, etc. But for me, eventually everyone will be on discs. Um, so if you've got the choice at the minute, um, if you're upgrading new bikes, new season coming up, for me, I'd go disc. Um, disc hydraulic for me. Um, the cable still a cable fundamentally going to have the extra braking power but you've still got um, the kind of old technology of a cable. <coughs> so just add any questions in the panel on the right hand side if you have got any for later. Uh, bike setup, um, it's got to be comfortable, you're riding it across all surfaces. Um, it's a lot less extreme than a lot of roads that up to um, seat to bar height um, isn't going to be as big. Um, get the levers at an angle, kind of. you can see in the photo they've got a nice angle so if you are going down a steep hill you're never feeling like you're going to go over the front of the bike and uh, you've got to be balanced on your bike for cross. Um, you've got to be nicely set up in the corners, not too much weight on that front wheel so it washes out but also just enough weight on it to gain grip. Um, so this obviously very very personal and obviously I'd recommend a good bike fit um, with someone who knows about cross and knows um, what you need from a cross bike. You need durable um, equipment that's going to last um, last all conditions and events so there's no point putting on that 120 gram full carbon saddle if it's going to break the third time you jump on it. So for me it's durable um, but all the same, you have got to think about your weight. There's no point trying to get a 10 kilo bike on your shoulder after doing all that training. Um, finally, you are allowed two, three bikes in cross. Um, top guys have even more. So if you do have the opportunity to have two bikes, definitely use it. Um, even at local level, uh, when conditions are bad, you're going to profit hugely from being able to change during the race. Even if it's only one change halfway through the race, it's going to make all the difference. The only thing I'd say about having two bikes is um, make sure they're fairly similar. Don't have the don't have a thing going on in your head during the race that you don't want to change because you have a favourite bike. Um, I know a lot of people have to turn up with two bikes and plod around on the same one and uh, it would have been quicker to change but they were going, oh, it's my second bike, it's my second bike, it's not as good. But there's no point having a second bike unless you actually use it. So um, think about that second bike and the advantages it's going to bring. Finally, for me, uh, race day nutrition. So depending, obviously, what time you race, you need a good breakfast. Um, very often, for a lot of people, the breakfast is going to be their meal three hours before the start, but if you're racing later in the day, then you need another meal three hours before the start. Um, something kind of light and simple. Um, I go for rice pudding. Um, it's obviously personal preference here. 
I know class van turnout likes to have uh, rice tarts from Belgium, so a slight twist on my rice pudding seems to work for him. Um, you can obviously maybe have a snack between then and the race on an energy bar, kind of banana, maybe a very simple sandwich, but not too much in between then. Um, keep um, well hydrated, kind of hydro drinks now, low sugar, low calorie, just replacing those electrolytes. Um, but the key with hydration is it's not just about the day. Um, hydration literally takes two to three days to get fully hydrated if you're low. So really think about coming up to that weekend and drinking the right sorts of drinks, not too much alcohol, not too much coffee um, until race day. Um, but once you start warming up, keep drinking and uh, a caffeine gel 20 minutes before the start usually does the trick. That kind of means you're warming up uh, while you're having it. So you shouldn't get a big insulin spike and it should be kicking in kind of at the start or five, ten minutes into the race. Um, obviously no, no feeding unless the conditions are really warm in cross, so we haven't got to think about that. And to be honest, you don't want, in such a high intensity effort, you don't want your stomach doing too much else. It's taking blood away from where you really need it in your, in your legs. Um, afterwards, get, get a recovery drink, protein and carbs down you as soon as possible and start replacing the fluid that you've obviously lost in that hour. Even in very cold conditions, you, you're dressed well and sweat a lot. Um, after that, kind of real food within a few hours and get back on track with your kind of normal routine. You've got to remember, cross is only an hour, so you haven't got to really overeat afterwards. Um, it's easy to indulge kind of the evening after a race, but you have only done an hour, uh, kind of. So you don't need to be eating like the tour riders, 7,000 calories in a day. Um, but a little tip, kind of protein before bed will just kickstart and help that recovery process before you're going into that next training week. Okay, thanks Ian. That's the uh, technical side of the webinar covered. Um, like I said earlier, if people would like to um, get their questions answered at the end, please um, please ask your questions on the um, in the question box in the corner of your screen. Um, I'm going to talk now a little bit about the fitness and training aspects of cyclocross. So what is the key to fitness for races? Um, well, basically, for races, it's, um, for cyclocross races, it's really important to have a high FTP. So an FTP is your functional threshold power, which is, in layman's terms, the power that you can sustain for one hour of duration, which for most categories is in and around um, the duration of the, of the cross race distance. So obviously it's important the higher um, power you can sustain for the hour, you know, the faster and the better you're going to race. Um, it's not as simple as, you know, if you as um, a time trialist, for example, then you just ride at a set power. So if your power is, you know, 300 watts, you basically ride at 300 watts for the duration of the, you know, 25 mile time trial. Cross is a little bit different or massively different in the fact that although you may average around and about your FTP power, it's not a steady effort, so you'll never be riding, uh, very rarely riding at 350 watts. What you'll be doing is efforts um, above and below it. So, as you know in cross, you go through a muddy section, you go through sand, you go over a little climb, you know, you put a massive surge of power, but then you might freewheel, you know, down a hill around the corner. So, it's much more uh, variable power than, than, say, a time trial. And, you know, that's why... Time trialists, for example, don't make very good uh, cyclocross riders. Um, that brings me on to um, you have to make repeated efforts. So, you know, like I'm talking about, you go up a hill, you go around a corner, you go through a sand pit, through a mud section, but you do that, um, you know, many, many times in a cross race. Um, we had some um, power data from Ian um, from last year from one of the World Cup races, and he actually made... Um, in a, in a World Cup cyclocross race, which was one hour, he made 180 um, times. He went over 600 watts, um, which is 10, 10 watts per kilo, 
um, and he did that 180 times throughout the duration of the race. So, you know, more or less, he was um, doing 10 seconds on, 10 seconds off for the, you know, for the duration of, of the race. So it was a big effort. You know, you're coming off the off the gas a little bit, and then you're doing it again, and it's just repeated, um, repeated bursts and repeated recovery for for you know the total of one hour. Um, so it's much more explosive than you know say a time trial, for example. Um, and of course, you need to be able to, to sustain that for one hour. You know, the duration of the race is is one hour or close to it. Um, so there's no use only being able to do the you know repeated efforts um, for only 15 minutes. You need to be able to do it for one hour. But that said, you don't need to you don't need to do it for two hours. You know, the the amount of people that kind of um, and all less aspects of cycling. Um, I get this amount of people that focus too much on the um, the duration of the races or the endurance side, and you know they go out and they're doing really long rides, and it's very rare that you get dropped in a race or you don't win a bike race because you can't do um, you know three or four hours on a bike. Um, you know if you can if you can do the effort for one hour in a cross race, then then that's all you need to do. You don't need to do it. You know, uh, for more than that, um, I'm sure Ian will kind of back me up on this, but there's many times, um, or there's very few times, I think Ian will tell you that he didn't win a race because he couldn't sustain the pace for an hour. But I imagine there's a lot of times that he didn't win a race because he can't pedal as fast as Sven Nix. You know, so it's not it's not all about um, you know going out and being able to ride a bike for three or four hours. It's, it's just being able to ride at race pace for, for one hour. And you need to focus on, you know, the intensity um, really before you, you know, focus on the endurance. Because once you start uh, racing and you get into the races, you know, the endurance kind of takes care of itself. Um, and the other thing that's really important, Ian actually said this at the start of the webinar, is front-loaded efforts. So what I mean by that is um, the first one or two minutes cycle across race, would be the hardest, more than likely the hardest part of the race. So you start from a complete um, standing start, and the gun goes off, and then you go in absolutely flat out. And you need to be able to practice to get a good start, um, and you also need to be able to. There's no use getting. You see some guys, and they fly off in the first lap, and they do five minutes, and they can do a really good start, but then they can't complete the the remainder of the race because they've gone too hard. So if you um, train that and you really work on it, you get to the point where you can make the front-loaded efforts, you can make a really good start effort, and you can still still uh, recover enough after it um, to be able to you know, uh, race without affecting your race. So there's no point in starting slow so that you, you're already 30, 40 seconds behind at the start of the first lap because you've already lost the race. But at the same point, there's no point starting like a madman and then then you know blowing towards the end of the race. So there's a balance balance in that and you know the more you train it and the more you practice those front loaded efforts, the better um, the better it's going to be in the race. And now we'll move on to some training sessions or what training you need to be doing for cyclocross. So like I said before, um, it's really important to have a high threshold for, for cyclocross but need to be able to incorporate um, bursts within that. So one good session that Ian does quite a lot will be to ride at threshold or ride just below threshold, sub-threshold, sub uh, maybe 90% uh, of his threshold. But instead of like um, just riding, um, riding at, at that threshold, every um, four or five minutes he'll throw in a 15 to 20 second burst, which will be... Um, over 600 watts for Ian, so around about 10 watts per kilo. Um, so you go from riding, say, thresholds 300 watts, um, or if, if you're using heart rate, you know, say your heart rate's 170 uh, beats per minute. You hold a steady pace, but then you throw in, um, it's not a flat-out sprint, but like a, a surge, a decent surge, and then as soon as you've finished uh, the 15 or 20 seconds, you go straight back into... Um, settling down at that pace because in cyclocross um, you have to recover while still under um, under load so 
you don't, you can't, there's no point in attacking and going 20 seconds flat out and then free wheeling for two or three minutes to completely recover because the nature of a cyclocross race isn't like that. So you still need to be able to sustain a high pace before and after doing the bursts. Um, and another one is that's really um, overlooked in my opinion is start practice. So the amount of times I ask people, okay, how often do you practice your starts? And they, they look at you a little bit gone out or they say, oh, well, I do occasionally. So then I ask, okay, do you, do you completely stop or do you just um, and let your body cool down or do you just, you know, stop and, and do your starts? And most people, they don't completely cool down. So what I would suggest doing was, would be to find a uh, course you know, maybe a five minute loop, but completely stop. So if you, obviously everybody warms up for cyclocross race, but then it's generally it's quite cold and everybody, you might, you might be on the start line for 10 minutes. So generally your body temperature will cool down, you know, a lot in that 10 minutes. So it's really important to um, be able to train and get your body used to making start efforts when, when cold basically. So if you find a loop in the woods um, and you stand there, you know, two or three minutes, just let your body cool down and you can do different uh, durations of start. So you can do 30 seconds all out, but it's good to carry on um, after the 30 seconds or one minute initial uh, start in a race, you'll perhaps settle down a little bit. So but you'll still do another three or four minutes at a high sustained pace. So if you get yourself maybe a five minute loop, um, stop, unclip, um, like Ian says, set your pedal, so it's replicating uh, race conditions, um, you know, better still get someone to count you down or, or count yourself down, um, practice clipping in, all out for 30 seconds per minute, and then a high sustained pace for, um, for the next four or five minutes, back to the start, again, stop, uh, cool down, you know, you might, depends on the level, level you're at, but you know, you might do, you know, four or five up to ten, ten start practice. You know, that would be, you could do that in a good, you know, 90 minute, two hour sessions with a warm up and cool down. That would be a really good um, thing to work on, like start practice. Um, so Ian's talked a lot about skills and different techniques, but it's a, it's a lot different doing skill work um, when you're, just riding a steady pace to when you're, you know, you've got your heart rate 170 beats per minute and you're under race pace. So while you're doing your start practice, you can also find a similar loop, maybe a 10 minute loop and do, you know, make yourself some obstacles, get some planks, get some corners, get some off cambers and work on the skills, but do it at race pace. So do 10 minute, you know, maybe in a session you do three 10 minute efforts off road um 10 to 15 minutes again depending on your uh, you know level um but really work on the skills at race pace so you know replicate race conditions it's all about um replicating um you know breaking down what elements are in a cross race and and replicating it. and the other thing to work on is like i said before with the with ian doing 180 um power spikes is cross is a lot about over and under uh, efforts. So a lot of the time you're over your threshold or you're under your threshold. So a classic session for a cross cross rider would be 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off. So you might do, again, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, it's probably easier to do this on the road or on a turbo trainer because you can, um, you know, you can keep a consistent um, road surface and gradient, but if you do 15 second, uh, you know, all out, 15 second back off, 15 all out, 15 off, and repeat that cycle for 10 or 15 minutes, um, and maybe do um, three, possibly four of those uh, build up to it, uh, four of those in, a, you know, an hour, an hour and a half session, it's a really good um, specific workout for, for cyclocross. Um, again, it's just replicating um, race conditions and race, you know, the demands of a race. So I think that pretty much um, brings us to the end now of the um, 
of the talking part of the session. Um, so if, like I said before, if you want to send in some Q&A questions, myself and Ian will do our best to answer as many of those as we can. Um, we've got a question here uh, for Ian. Yep. He's asking about, would you recommend for cyclocross, uh, would you recommend using uh, SPD shoes and pedals? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's kind of pretty much what everyone uses. Um, the SPD Shimano flipless system. There are a few out there, like I know Time um, brought out a set of pedals. Um, and there's a few others like egg beaters, etc. Um, but they all kind of have their weaknesses. Um, apart from kind of for me, the Shimano ones are the best all-round um, pedal you can have across, really. Um, okay, another question for you in is what about frame sizes? Um, so compared comparing cyclocross uh, frames with road, where would you um, yeah, personally, I run the same um, frame size as my road bike, but <coughs> obviously they're built differently um, because they're a cross bike. So if you buy the same frame size in a cross bike as you do a road, um, nine times out of ten it will already have a shorter top tube, which is what you're looking for in... When I said about the bike setup, the kind of the less extreme, more comfortable kind of position that you're looking for. Um, so if you end up running the same stem length, you actually end up normally running um, kind of one centimetre shorter than your road setup. Um, for me, I run my cross setup all year round on my road bike. Um, you hear of some people running their cross saddles um, a touch lower, but for me... Um, saddle height is kind of a fundamental should be the same on all bikes really so yeah um, I'd go for the same um, frame size because normally they're tailor made for cross anyway so should work out okay okay um, there's a guy here Richard who's asking I've heard you should always use glue rather than tape for tubs is that the case if so what's the difference um, absolutely I wouldn't use tape just because um, the forces on the tubbing cross um, are so much higher than say during a time trial or on a road race um, you're running like around 20 psi and when you're cornering on 20 psi and the tub rolls um, on the carcass it means the contact with the rim has got to be really really good and um, with the tape you just you just don't get the same um, the same contact um, as with glue, the kind of pretty much everyone's using the Conti uh, Continental glue, tubular glue um, for gluing cross tubs on. Um, there is kind of um, many different ways and different recipes and potions, um, but for me, it's all about layering up the glue, um, getting a real solid kind of connection between the tub and the rim. Um, so yeah, definitely glue for cross. Okay, um, there's a good question here about running. So yeah. how much run training uh, should you do? Um, do you do any specific drills? And also, do you continue running during the summer? Um, I think the summer would be a really good, well, the off season, so for most people that summer um, would be a really good time to do running. Um, the thing with cyclocross is you don't actually run that much, as much as you think. You probably only run for five or ten minutes during the duration of a of a cross race. So while it is important, it's not massively important. So in um, in the summertime, um, you perhaps do maybe once or twice a week, ten or fifteen minutes, maybe up to twenty minutes of running. No you know no um, major uh, drills um, the problem with running is if you do too much running then it kind of leaves you fatigued a little bit for um, for the you know if you road training or um, you know cycle training um, and then also during the season um, like Ian does a lot of his run training incorporates it in his skill sessions 
Um, so once, twice a week, he does skill training. Um, again, it's important to do to do that, you know, under a, under loads so a high heart rate. So if you're doing a, you know, a technical loop, um, you get off and run up a bank, um, just like you would in a race. Um, so it is important, but it's at the end of the day, it's you're only going to do five or ten minutes of running in a race. So it's not, you know, you don't need to be doing two hours of run training a week. Um, would you agree with that, Ian? Absolutely. It's just about keeping it specific and also running during a cross race is different because you've started your run by jumping off a bike. Um, so you're kind of preloading your muscles um, by hitting the ground before each run. Um, you're throwing a bike on your shoulder as you're beginning to run and then you're running with a bike on your shoulder. So in terms of running, it's very specific. It's it's not just going for a run or a jog. And nine times out of ten, you have to dismount because of an obstacle like a steep bank or mud um, where you really have to kind of press on just to get through um, the conditions. So it, for me, it's about keeping it specific, do it in your cross sessions, um, and really um, learn the kind of the whole whole technique side of things around the running, which for me, you'll probably make up more time being smooth on and off the bike than you will actually on the running sections. If you incorporate it all together, then uh, jobs are good. Okay, we've got um, a guy who's a little bit confused about the disc brake. Um, so he says, disc cable, you said you recommend it, called it disc hydraulic. Do you mean disc mechanical? Can you explain this, please? I'd recommend the disc hydraulic. Um, the disc mechanical will be with a cable. And fundamentally, if you've still got a cable connecting uh, the lever to the brake, you've still got the issues that you have with cables, which um, obviously Shimano are trying to get away from with bringing out DI2 and obviously the hydraulic system. Uh, with the hydraulic system, you have a lot more feel um, which is fundamentally what you need from a cross brake. So I'm recommending the hydraulic uh, systems. Okay, someone else is asking um, what's the best type of shoe for cross? I guess that's, we covered that with the SPD, but... Uh... <coughs> yeah, definitely the SPD setup. Um, obviously, I'm, <laughs> I'm governed by sponsors, what I use. Um, but a good all-round shoe that um, isn't too stiff because you have got a run in it and you definitely need a shoe that takes um, studs or spikes. You need to be able to put um, studs in the front of the shoe really help with grip when you're running up muddy banks. Um, for me, um, you need a ratchet or a boa system on the shoe really. Um, in deep mud. If you've just got Velcro, um, as a junior I had Velcro, three strap Velcro and I lost a shoe in deep mud just because the mud gets in the Velcro and it can come undone. So if you can afford a pair of shoes where there's a ratchet sort of system, um, I'd go with that. Okay, um, there's a guy asking, um, would you recommend um, training with power for cyclocross. Um, I personally think training with power for cyclocross is really good um, because it's difficult when you're doing, if you was doing for example the 15 seconds on, 15 second off efforts, if you're using heart rate to base that it's pretty much impossible because you, your heart rate, there's a lag with heart rate so it takes time to respond um, you might finish your 15 seconds and your heart rate's still rising. So in that uh, scenario, it's better to do those efforts more on feel. Whereas if you're using power, power is, um, you know, absolute power. As soon as you start pedaling, um, the, the power goes up. And as soon as you stop pedaling, the power goes down, you know, instantly. So for 15 seconds or, you know, short duration intervals like that, it's a very good way to measure um, you know, uh, Ian uses it a lot, uh, both on the cross bike and for training on the road um, for that reason. So there's, it's just instant, power is instant. 
So it's a good way to quantify um, training load and training. You can be much, much more specific with your training, especially for the short, intense, intense efforts. Um, there's actually a question here for you, Ian, um, or maybe for me to answer. Um, it's actually asking, what is your threshold or what's per kilo? Six question mark. Um, <laughs> If you want me to answer that, I can answer that. Um, it's up to you. Well, if you just give them a number, that means nothing. Yeah. Well, basically, um, so six watts per kilo is uh, what you would be your power, um, threshold power, um, divided by your weight. So Ian is 64, 65 kilos. Um, so to be six watts per kilo... Um, he'd have to be putting out, you know, around about 380 to 390 watts, um, which last season he wasn't quite there. He was probably 5.7, um, but yeah, I'd say more or less he's there now, and certainly by the start of this cycle last season he'll be he'll be there. So you know, I'd like to see um, see how much that improves the performance. I'm sure. Um, you know, it will enable them to make another step up uh, from last year. So yeah, that's a um, good guess. Six watts per kilo is more or less what Ian is. There's another question here. How do you train for the sort of slippery, chopped up corners you only seem to get on a race course, especially at the beginning of the season when it's still dry and grippy everywhere else? What was that? Right. How do you train for um, the sort of slippery, chopped up conditions that you only get seem to get on a race course? Um, well, I just have a circuit that I use in training. And to be honest, it doesn't take long just repeatedly riding the same, maybe. I have like a... Um, I break down kind of a five ten minute circuit. I've like a bit of a, a run up section and a bit of a cornering section, and then a few steep banks and rideable banks, etc. And I can make little circuits out of those circuits. So if I'm just practicing cornering, I'll literally just do a cornering drill, and it's not long. If the conditions are kind of a bit wet, um, it's not long before you're actually cutting up the corners just by riding it yourself. And if you can get a few mates together and set up a bit of a cross session of an evening, uh, you'd be surprised. It doesn't take long for the actual ground to cut up. Um, so it's just practice, practice, practice. And on a race day, um, get out there and maybe do your warm-up on the course and uh, get really to grips with the conditions before you start. Another question here coming is, how important is diet and nutrition in your preparation? Do you have any tips? Um, yeah, obviously the fuel you're putting into your body means um, or leads to what you can put out, basically. Um, so if you're filling up with junk, you're going to put out junk watts, basically. Um, you need to a balanced, all-rounded diet. Um, there's no no shortcuts, no secrets. Um, just a well-rounded diet. Um, and the biggest thing for me is getting good quality food in you after training sessions, maybe training twice a day or backing up over a five, six day block. It's really important to get the food, There's like a 20 minute window after you finish training really to get a shake or some real, real food down you and that really kickstarts the recovery process um, which, is, which is key to consistent training. Okay, um, it's a good question here. You've talked about racing for an hour. Any difference you'd recommend 40 minutes vet races or youth races, for example? Um, I think ultimately the races um, are the same. It's just obviously the duration is slightly lower for, you know, it's 40 minutes an hour. It doesn't make a massive difference, but um, I guess in a senior race you often see guys um, like Ian's really good for the last 15 minutes he kind of comes good or is able to su sustain the same pace some people drop off um, with a vets race because it's not you know it's not so long 
you can perhaps go out a little bit harder but ultimately the training is very similar it's just you need to you know the the efforts you know like Ian might do 40 minute hour long you know blocks of threshold work where if you're only racing for 30 or 40 minutes you know you perhaps won't need to do um, such a long long effort so you could reduce the duration of some of your efforts a little bit but there's not a massive amount of difference the principles are the same it's just the the duration of the efforts which you perhaps reduce a little bit um, the question here Ian on back to tyres is do you use any sealant for tubers and how much um, <coughs> Well, the, I'm sponsored by Challenge, and they actually come pre-sealed. So for me, even though I'm sponsored by them, that's actually a massive plus for me. So the Challenge Team Edition tubulars are pre-sealed. You don't have to bother with aqua seal, etc. But on uh, kind of Dugas, FMB, um, I know they're not pre-sealed. And if you want them to last longer than a season, then I highly recommend aqua seal. Uh, just a thin layer once you've um, glued the tub on all the way around should see you through a couple of seasons but the only issue is make sure it is properly sealed because you can get water underneath uh, the aqua seal and then that actually rots from the inside out kind of thing so make sure it's properly sealed okay um, I think we're almost the end now um, so we'll do uh, one one question each. Um, if you want to answer in, is there any tips for not getting not getting mud in your cleats and pedals? I guess it's difficult <laughs> not to get it in, but maybe how to clear it would be a better question. Yeah, yeah. Um, not getting mud in would be to be able to ride up everything on the course, but obviously that's not possible uh, for everyone. So big thing for me is just if you do get to the situation where you can't clip in anymore, just give the bottom of your shoes a real good bang on the pedals. Just um, smack your foot down on the pedal. Normally clears them. Or tack the side of your shoe on the crank arm. That kind of thing. Just um, try and dislodge whatever's in there. Um, nine times out of ten, if you give the give the cleats a good whack on the pedals, something gets moved and you you can clip in again. Um, but it's one of those things with cross, um, everyone suffers with it a little bit, so it's just um, dealing with it in the race and not panicking. Okay, final question is, well it's actually two questions but we can answer it in one, is someone's asking about is it best to warm up on the course or on rollers and another person's asking um, what, you know, what sort of things would you do to warm up? Now, um, Ian, for example, always rides course uh, in the morning, um, but that's more to look at the lines. Um, so he's not he's not actually putting in much effort. He's not he's not using that as warm up. That's just to you know check tire pressures, check the lines and conditions of the course. Um, he then start his warm up maybe 30 to 40 minutes before the start. Um, you need to be on the start line usually, you know, 10 minutes to be safe. Uh, for gridding um, and a warm up doesn't need to be massively intensive and it doesn't need to be massively long it just needs to basically warm through the engine so what the basic warm up that we do with Ian would be um, a five minute just easy pedaling just you know warming up um, and then a ramp of about eight minutes so you slowly every minute increasing the intensity and bringing the heart rate up to kind of threshold stroke race pace and then he'd probably um, either do this on the rollers or if you've got resistance on the rollers or if you haven't got resistance on the rollers I know Ian gets off the rollers and rides towards the start and he might perform two or three you know 10 or 15 second sprints just to kind of activate the muscles get everything uh, flowing um, and then continue spinning around for a couple of minutes and then get on the line um, like I said earlier, you're going to cool down a lot anyway, um, but it's important, you know, if you can, just get the blood flowing and activate the muscles before um, before the start. Then, you know, so much the better. 
So you don't need to, you know, you don't need to be warming up for an hour. You just need to do 20, 25 minutes focus warm up. Bring the, bring everything up to race pace, and then go and get on the get on the line. Um, I think that's pretty much all we've got time for this evening. I'd just like to thank Ian for his time, and thank you all for listening in this evening. If you have any questions, we're going to send out a recording of the of the uh, webinar this evening. And if you have any more questions, you can email us at info at digdeepcoaching.com or there's quite a bit of information on our website on digdeepcoaching.com. Thank, thank you everybody for your time and hopefully we'll do another webinar in the near future. Thank you. Cheers, thanks.